Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating, from the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day. Each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is... Who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show today. We have a great lineup. It's a girl power show. Girl power, girl power. In the first hour, we have Marie Jones coming on to talk about mythology, hidden history in plain sight. And in the second hour, we're going to be speaking with Susan Shumsky about the power of the aura. But don't forget, Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, energy healings, and psychic readings. So if you have stuff going on in your life and you need some insights, guidance, or help, give me a call, send me an email, which is the best thing. Stop by the site, SoulHealer.com. Check it out. Um, It's also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com. And actually, I have a very big announcement to make about that this week, and I'll be making this for the next few weeks. So that website, I've kind of been talking about it a little bit. That website has finally been launched. It has been totally redesigned. The program has been kind of revamped and given a facelift. But one of the extra, 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 extra coolest parts, which is why you need to stop by there today, today, is we have just launched a free download. It's a 50-page Jumpstart Your Intuition ebook that you can get for free. I like free. Free is always good. And you just go to the website, put your email address in, hit, you know, hit the button. It'll send you a link that you can go and get the book. Written by me, has really cool stuff in it. You get to like practice doing little psychic readings and doing little energy work things. It's really kind of cool. And best of all, free. Whew. Anyway, uh, if you missed the show, go to the Just Energy Radio webpage, www.justenergyradio.com. Sign up for our newsletter or go to YouTube, Just Energy Radio on YouTube. And if you go to there, subscribe to our channel. It keeps growing, and I just appreciate everyone that does stop by and signs up for the newsletter or subscribes to the YouTube channel. Um, A couple of other quick announcements. Uh, This weekend, um, it's, you know, I haven't written down wrong, and it sounds better this way. I have Weird Fest Texas, but apparently it's Texas Weird Fest, something like that. Anyway, it's this Saturday in Glen Rose, Texas. Um, it should be a lot of fun. There's going to be some great speakers there. Uh, you can get information on the Just Energy Radio webpage about it. April 12th, History Haunts and Legends Conference in spooky Jefferson, Texas. Um, Pensacola, Florida. I will be there on April 13th doing a presentation. Uh April 26th, I'll be in Tyler at the Tyler Paranormal Conference. And for my good friends in the Midwest, like more Midwest than Texas, I will actually be in Collinsville, Illinois, which is just outside of St. Louis, Missouri, uh, August 16th at the Ancient Mysteries International Conference. They're going to be talking about the Golden Age, past and future. Whew. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about Marie, and we're going to get her on the air and talking about her new book, Viral Mythology. Marie D. Jones is a best-selling author, radio host, public speaker, and screenwriter. 
She has been on hundreds of radio shows and appeared on the History Channel's Nostradamus Effect series. She is also the host of her own radio show, Paraffin Radio, with Larry Flaxman and co-host and co-host the popular Dreamland radio show. Marie, I didn't even know this about you, so please welcome the author of Viral Mythology, Marie Jones. Hey, girly. Oh. Hello there. How are well, you? Parafringe is no longer. Larry and I haven't done that in a while, so I think you've got an old bio. <laughs> I always that, have an old bio. You have an old bio. Well, our bios change so much, too. I know. Um, I mean, you guys are just like popping <laughs> books out. You know, I just had Larry on a few weeks ago, which was uh-huh. very cool uh, because, you know, the show used to be in the afternoon and he could never come on. I so, know. I know. Yeah. But it was good. You know, because, and I have to tell you, you know, he, we talked about The Grid, your, your right. last book. And I, I have to tell you, I think that's my favorite book that you guys have put out. I think... Well, I have a hard time with that because I think I love all our books. But I think it was probably the most fun for he and I because it was just sort of like a culmination of all the ideas that we had been working on in previous books. Although there, you know, there probably will be a part two someday because we continue to do more research and come up with more ideas. But, yeah, that was a really good one. But I love all our books. <laughs> I mean, I love all your books and, you know, too, but I just... Is, is that still the strongest book for us is 11 and 11. Really? And that really blows me away. Yeah, yeah, there's still so many people that just really respond to that whole time prompt thing and the whole 11 11 phenomenon. So, you know, I think people are becoming more aware of that or it's, you know, and so... I, I could understand why it is because I don't think anybody else has really written about that topic. Exactly. Yeah, and it's funny because I kind of thought that people it would taper off after a while because there was that association with the whole you know December twenty first two thousand twelve thing, but it hasn't really. I mean, I think we're still between the two of us getting so many emails and messages from people. A lot of them who are kind of new to the whole phenomenon. Oh, why do I keep seeing 1111? And I heard you wrote a book. And so it's just really strange how that just sort of keeps on chugging along. You know, and and for the listeners, you know, my take on it's not just 1111. It's, you know, those double digits. For me, it's 711. It has always been 711. Yeah, for me, it's always 333. So, but it's just, you know, anybody, any time prompt is, is unusual and, oftentimes personal to the individual, but yeah, it's amazing how people responded. And I, we thought everybody hated numbers, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's the language of the universe. Mm-hmm. People do respond to it. It just makes me think, well, maybe I need to go get a Slurpee at Seven Eleven. I don't know. You do. See some wonderful synchronistic event is going to happen. So if you get that sort of intuitive feeling, you got to go get that Slurpee. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> it's trying to tell you something. <laughs> so, girl, why why did you guys decide to write viral mythology? Yeah, this was a real sort of deviation for us, um, which was really interesting, but a lot of fun to write. You know, it's funny because it kind of started with conversations that Larry and I talk all the time. And it kind of started with – we were – just toying around with some ideas of things that interested us and fascinated us that we hadn't written about yet. And we both were kind of fascinated with whether or not there was any science to stories, whether, and we were almost talking about today, you know, novels or TV shows and movies. And we kind of started thinking, well, what about myths, you know, mythologies of different regions of the world and then what about religious parables and stories that are told like in the bible or other religious texts and then it's kind of like okay well what about fairy tales and and uh, even songs and folklore and legends and tall tales and it just really morphed into an exploration of whether or not there's actual factual information embedded in things like stories, you know, dating back to even primitive times, um, art, architecture. Were our ancestors trying to tell us something or trying to convey ideas and information through obviously the only means that they had available to them at the time? And it just morphed into this 
bigger picture, uh, which became viral mythology. And I just got to say that the title itself came from our publisher, New Page Books. I don't know exactly who thought it up, but they, they deserve an award because I think it's just such a killer title. Mm-hmm. It just really embodies everything that we were writing about. How do ideas go viral? How does information spread? How did it spread back then without social networking and Facebook and texting and emailing and you know all of the mass communication stuff that we're so reliant on today? How did ideas spread among our ancestors? So it's just all those questions that we were asking. It's like, you know what? We're going to write a book about it. And there it is. There it is. (laughs) There it is. (laughs) Well, I mean, is there a difference between the concept of myths, legends, fairy tales, folklore, old wives' tales, and whatever other name you could put on these stories that come down to us? You know, do they actually have separation between one kind and the other yeah they do i think you know most of us are familiar with the different types of uh storytelling that has come down to us myths tend to tended to have been more about the world view of a particular region that was obviously presented in a, in a fantastical very imaginative setting and yet in myths, we find so many common themes and elements and motifs and symbols that can give us a real understanding of what those people were like at the time, what was important to them, what they were going through. Fairy tales are their own, it's like its own separate world. Fairy tales were really meant to teach different kinds of truths, not factual, Joe lived in you know such and such year and he had eight kids, but more uh, thematic morals, behavior, ways to behave in the world. So fairy tales embody a different kind of truth presented in a very often sweet story, sometimes not so sweet if you go back to the grim fairy tales, um, that are often directed at children, believe it or not, as a way to try to control and manipulate their behavior. You know, then you have things like legends and folklore and tall tales, which oftentimes, in fact, more times than not, were based on real living people or a real factual historical event, but just sort of got embellished upon the more the story was told over time. So, yes, to answer your question, there are definite uh, characteristics for each kinds of storytelling, but I think that they're all designed to teach us way okay I, I guess you kind of like slipped out of there for a second oh did, you know <laughs> i thought you did too and i kind of kept talking this skype has been really weird lately i don't know are we being zapped by something <laughs> i don't know and we're not even talking about ghosts or anything you know? i know, so it. I good. know. Oh, there it's you know we're gonna probably talk about ancient aliens at some point here so maybe it's the aliens i don't know <laughs> Well, you know, I, I do say that when my guests, you know, disappear, it's like, oh, I think they've been abducted. Exactly. Maybe they had some missing time. Oh, no, I just kept talking because I figured maybe somebody will hear me. <laughs> well, actually, it was just a couple of words, but we're good. good. We're good. Um, um, you know, and you're a writer, so you know, that's, you know what I always found so interesting? Like, you've written nonfiction. To me... You can tell a lot of facts and statistics and truths and facts and all that crap in nonfiction. But did you ever notice how oftentimes you're more enlightened by fiction? You learn more about the truths of the human experience through fiction, and whether that's a novel or a movie or a TV show. And I think it's because that stuff plays right to our subconscious with the archetypes and the imagery and the symbolism and the, you know, all of the hidden themes and stuff. Whereas nonfiction is very left brain, very linear and analytical. So it doesn't quite get to us on that deeper level that right brain fiction does. That's, you know, that's how I feel about it. Well, I think it's hard for people to really relate to, you know, that very dry analytical type material. They can't, you know, bring it, you know, they can't relate to it on a personal level. Right. They get it in the left brain. They get it, you know, the rational brain. 
but they're not feeling it where they it becomes a part of their experience or part of their their deeper understanding. And I think myths, you read a, a Greek or Roman or a Norse or Mesoamerican myth, what have you, and you feel like you're reading a piece of purely imaginative entertainment, but you're also getting some deeper stuff going on there that you may not even be consciously aware of. And I think I find that so fascinating because whenever we talk about truth, we think of it in terms of facts and statistics. But there again, I believe our ancestors were also concerned with preserving and passing down the wisdom, their deeper truths, their understandings of the world around them and their, the role of human beings in it. But then you have people like our good friend, Laird Scranton. Um, Laird, I love Laird. I love, <laughs> you know, they came to visit, te- came to Texas, and they were at my house like two weeks ago, him and his wife. Did they? Oh, yeah. cool. <laughs> That's very a- cool. Um, you know, but we have people like Laird who are uncovering information that suggests that our ancestors knew a whole lot more than we give them credit for. You know, they did understand you know, concepts and physics and and concepts that we in the 21st century are rediscovering. Exactly. I think that's fascinating. And I also also think it speaks to how distracted we are today by technology and all of the the fun trappings that we have that take our, um, you know, sort of take our attention away from the world around us. We're talking about tribes like the African, the West African Dogon tribe. These people lived close to the land. They lived with nature. They observed everything around them, above and below, and the cycles of of growth. And we don't have that anymore. We're so sheltered. I mean, unless you live out in the country on a farm where you get to really be immersed in the natural cycle of things. But, But isn't it funny how we look at people like the Dogon as being primitive, And yet they knew more probably about quantum physics than we're, you know, we're just now starting to figure a lot of that out in the last 50, 60, 75 years. So, and what I love about the work that Laird does is he's looking for, uh, he calls it comparative cosmology, which like comparative mythology or comparative religion, you look for those common elements, those common symbols that are repeated in, in every regional myth Uh, or, you know, whatever their storytelling was. And you have to say to yourself, okay, you know, it's really interesting that no matter where you lived in the world, in primitive and ancient times, we all understood the same stuff. We just labeled it differently. But we, we seem to, our ancestors seem to all have had a very solid understanding about the world around them, almost in a cosmological sense. They didn't have telescopes and computers and things like that. They were just going off of the information that was passed down to them, their observation, and who knows? I mean, some people believe we had a little extraterrestrial help from above, too. (laughs) Okay, well, I would be one of those people. Yeah, Uh, (laughs) that's one of the things I looked at, sure. Well, you know... There is something about being human, you know, just in the general sense of the word. And so you have cultures like, you know, I like using the Aborigines of Australia as my test case, you know, right. and they have all of the makings of culture, but they've been isolated for thousands of years, but they are just as human and they have the same, you know, rights about marriage they have the same rights about you know uh circumcision and you know when a child turns 13 or whatever you know they come into manhood they have all of these things that we see as culture um that are around the other rest of the world and it just makes you go okay so how did that happen how did everybody learn these same things yeah uh, you know, there are different theories, and I think uh, the ancient alien slash ancient astronaut, whichever way you like it, that theory is very popular because it does easily explain these, not just leaps in technology for human advancement, but how information jumped, <coughs> excuse me, from one part of the world to another without the means that we, of communication that we're so reliant and used to today 
how did one region and another region thousands of miles away develop similar ideas and ways of doing certain things uh, at the same time? You know, were they communicating telepathically? And I mean, they could have been tapping into some kind of collective unconscious, if you want to go that route. Um, but a lot of people feel like because there's so much symbolism and imagery and stories that have mentions of what could be extraterrestrial beings or creatures from above or craft flying through the sky that we maybe did get a little assistance from advanced civilizations. I'm not arguing with you. Uh, <laughs> well, wait a minute. I wrote a whole book on the topic. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? There's people though that will say, the complete opposite, that why are we selling ourselves short as human beings? Because we've made amazing leaps in advancement and knowledge on our own. And when you can look over the last hundred years and see how we've done that. But there's a lot of, I like to call it circumstantial evidence to show that we may have been interacting with some awfully strange creatures. <laughs> and you got to wonder why so many cultures drew such pictures or had such imagery in their art or told such stories that were so similar. Why is that motif so similar of, you know, mm -hmm. the people wearing helmets and, and uh, what looked like craft flying through the air that were simply not a part of that culture at the time. So, yeah, <laughs> I yeah, definitely, exactly. I mean, I've, <laughs> you know, I've done interviews and, you know, I'll get the person that's like, well, they're archetypes. It's like, well, why, why is, are they Types. You know, why is the archetype about strength or whatever always represented in the same way? Why is the trickster always like either a snake or a fox? That has to you start know? somewhere, yeah. It has to start somewhere. Start and it's some, like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, why can't it be a cow? You know? Exactly. And why that's. Why can't it be that, a yeah. grasshopper? I mean, why is it always the same thing? It, it you know, from a conventional common sense point of view it doesn't make any sense right and especially when somebody halfway around the world is using the same imagery but they've never met this civilization over here and yet they what they you know is that archetype obviously again like young said part of the collective but it still has to originate somewhere you know there wasn't just this one guy who sat down and said well the archetype for fear or for this will be this I mean, those things usually tend to originate from actual human experience. And when those experiences happen to enough humans, they become a part of the, the archetypes that we all tap into, we all recognize, um, whether we do it subconsciously or not. So, yeah, you're right. Those images have to have an origin point. And it's, I've not heard a lot of people say that. You know, like you said, they'll just sort of excuse it by saying, and Larry and I do try to cover other theories because we want to cover everything. We want to give every theory its day. But you will have people, as soon as the alien theory is mentioned, who just, oh, no, 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 that's not possible. You know, we did it. And here are some ways that we could have done it. Well, granted, yes, those are very valid theories. But how then do you turn around and explain all of this other stuff? <laughs> it points to this one theory. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's an ongoing debate, as you well know. I don't debate it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know, a lot of people do. <laughs> oh, I know. I, I know. I just am kidding. Uh, and, uh, you know, you got to give some props to shows like Ancient Aliens, even though I don't necessarily agree that everything they say is alien. What they're doing is showing a lot of the, um, again, I call it circumstantial evidence because we don't have proof because we weren't there. That's the problem. We're talking about history. So we have to sort of interpret it the best we can with the clues that we have. But, you know, they present a lot of really good information and a lot of people will sensationalize it. But, you can, you know, again, what do you do? It's like with the paranormal. We can't necessarily prove that ghosts exist, but we sure do have an awful lot of circumstantial evidence pointing to that. So because you don't have that sort of definitive proof, do you brush it all under the rug? I mean, the same with UFOs. You know, it's, there's a ton of circumstantial evidence about that. But again, it falls into that we don't really believe. 
But, you know, you'll appreciate this one. I, I wrote an article and then I made a video about it where I talk about ghosts and gods of antiquity. And if you think about it, you know, people had a belief in ghosts, you know, going back as far back as we had a belief in these quote unquote gods. Absolutely. Except we represent but we represent gods on pottery and on walls and in figurative art, but not ghosts. Right. Why? Is it because at some point in time the gods were real or there was something tangible where a ghost is it in, in, in nature intangible? Right, right. And, and along that same line of thought, the idea that I think, you know, it's a very solid uh, idea that when – our ancestors were talking about gods and deities. They may have been talking about entities from other, other worlds. And to them, these entities would appear to be godlike. So, I mean, if you, you know, I've heard this before that if you go back and you replace the word god or goddess or deity with alien, <clears throat> a lot of times things start to make sense. <laughs> a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But at the same time, you know, there are cultural evolution certainly develops in unusual ways. Um, one of the theories that we had to look into was genetic transmission of knowledge, which I happen to think is really fascinating. The idea that our ancestors could have genetically passed down beliefs, traditions, understandings, wisdom, knowledge through our genes. And I saw an article about a week ago that sort of backed that up a little bit. It seems like we're getting, I remember a time when it was really taboo to think about um, cellular memory and genetic memory and all that kind of stuff. But now it seems like, you know, even science is going, hmm, <laughs> maybe we need to look into this. And here's the thing. So by the time Larry and I looked at all the different possibilities, whether it's uh, alien-assisted uh, whether it's mental networking, the way we computers sort of network, or like some kind of mind virus. Because, you know, thoughts are very contagious, emotions are contagious. All of these different things, cultural evolution, genetic transmission, um, oral, you know, word of mouth. I mean, it would take a lot longer, but to us thousands of years later, it would look like it happened overnight virtually. The thing is, is that there is a lot of evidence for each theory. And so they may have all been working together to create the history that we know of and, and the history that we don't yet know of because we're still digging it up. And I think when we look at what happens today with the transmission of knowledge and information, we see all of those things at play as well. So I think all the theories make sense. And I don't necessarily know that we have to just pick one. I think, mm -hmm. you know, possibly ancient alien theory was responsible for certain knowledge and information being transmitted across regional lines or what have you. But there are also other things that seem to be working as well. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's just the way that we operate. We try to find different ways to do the same thing. Well, I mean, one of the things that you talked about, which I thought was just a little controversial, so I have to bring it up, of course. <laughs> Was yep. you kind of you kind of threw Jesus into this mix of mythology, you know, yeah. and that's kind of one of the things that there are some people that question, you know, one whether Jesus was alive in the first right. place, and if he was a, a person, you know, regardless of his status, alive or not, you know, that this story about him grew and spread to really take over a large segment of the population. Right. And, and you kind of compared that to the spread of mythology. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it was called the Jesus model. And, you know, we're not trying to insult anyone. Our desire, our goal, and our job is to try to get to the truth. I don't know why people wouldn't want to know the truth about anything, including who Jesus really was <laughs> and what he really may have done. Uh, but again, you know that there are religions that are based on politics, you know, come into play here. But when you look at the, the story of Jesus as if it were a myth, you see parallels with other myths. You see parallels with other religious figures too over time, including Buddha and Mithras and uh, Horus, the son of Osiris and Isis. You see, 
all these common themes, you know, the birth date of December 21st, born of a virgin, the resurrection, the transfiguration, all these different elements. Now, to me, the fascination is more, wow, before Jesus, there were other Jesuses, and afterwards, there were others. So he was an archetype, and he was a living archetype, okay? He very well may have been a living person who walked the earth and did everything that people believe he did. But guess what? He wasn't the only one. Apparently, he was part of a greater archetype that we see throughout other religious stories and myths. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Do you think that some of the stories were borrowed from other mythology to kind of, you know, make his story be more robust? I think absolutely, because Buddha... He lived long before Christ did. And a lot of the um, quotes that Buddha made, a lot of the famous things like the do unto other, you know, the uh, golden rule, those are attributed to Buddha first. I have a really cool book called Jesus and Buddha. And I forgot the name of the author. I think it's Marcus. Are you saying that Jesus was a plagiarist? No. (laughs) No, no, you know what? I'm saying that all of the men and women who fit this particular archetype were teaching the same kind of wisdom. You know, they would have been the spiritually enlightened knowledge bearers who all understood the golden rule, (laughs) you know, the way that people, the Dalai Lama might do it today, or Mother Teresa, or or what have you. Uh, In my personal view, Jesus probably was a living person. Was he who people say he is today based on the interpretation upon interpretation upon interpretation that has been piled on the original story? No, we do that with myth. We take a possible seed of truth and we embellish upon it to the point where it's almost not recognizable anymore. And that's what you have religious scholars for and historians and archaeologists and all these people are working to try to find the original source, the core truth you know, the original point of this story's beginning to see who really were these people. Where did they really live? What did they really do? Were they real to begin with? And in order to do that, we have to weed through the imaginative, the speculative, the interpretative, all all the stuff that was piled on later to get back to who this person might have really been. I think that's incredibly frustrating. And we might never know. We might never know. And see, that's the problem with history, as you well know, is that because we weren't there to personally witness it, um, we really, and then when you think about all of the information and ideas and innovations that didn't make it to us, that were suppressed or destroyed or so badly altered from their original form, we wouldn't even recognize it. We really don't have a solid understanding of our own history. It's being revealed so slowly because in my opinion you have scientists have to back up what is in these stories in order for the public to accept it as real so in other words you read a myth or you find common themes and myths or religious stories like this archetype of the jesus model and really the only way to prove these points is for the scientific community and by that i mean the people who go do the digging and the discovering and the, um, you know, putting everything into nice categories and uh, the archaeologists and anthropologists and historians and all these people, they're responsible for finding the physical evidence to back up the theories that we get from these stories. And so the two sides have to be working together, I think, for anybody to ever have a real solid view of what our history is. And you know how hard that is to get all those people working together. Well, but it seems like what's coming out of mainstream archaeology is just, you know, the party line and a bunch of lies. And, you know, you talk about sites like Gobekli Tepe or, you know, giant bones that Mm -hmm. are missing and, you know, and all of this really cool stuff that they're like, oh, well, that carbon-14 test can't be right. It's right. It's not right. Brush it under the rug. But you know what? 
can't hide information anymore the way they used to be able to. I mean, thank they got God. The <laughs> and the fact that so many people are writing books and getting them out there that have the alternative ideas, that have the other theories that are not being discussed in the mainstream. And if you think about our poor ancestors, I mean, if you didn't go with the party line, a lot of times you ended up dead. But if you had that information, that knowledge that you wanted to spread, you had to do it on the sly. I mean, you had to do it under the radar. Today, we can be very open about discussing these other ideas. And, you know, the Internet, as much of a distraction as it can be, it certainly has allowed the non-mainstream realities to come into play. And there's nothing anybody can do about that. I mean, you shut down the Internet, there's enough technological mavericks out there that they'll think of something else, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, I mean, before 2012, you know, I had this one friend, he goes, oh, I know people that have already, like, got the equipment together to go back to the old bulletin board system just to keep the information moving until something else comes up. It's like once you open that floodgate, you know, there's no way really, in my opinion, that you could shut it down. People wouldn't accept it. Well, so just I think, think of the young people that wouldn't accept it. Uh, I mean, it's bad enough that we're like, <laughs> but the younger people, oh, they've never known anything different, have they? <laughs> Come on, they oh, can't even imagine standing up and changing the channel on the TV set. Oh, or doing it with a, you know, what do you call it? A wrench or pliers? Pliers. Pliers. Like, <laughs> was broken? <laughs> But no, that I, was only at grandma's house. Come on. Yeah, exactly. Or they had the foil on it, the foil bunny ears. Oh, those were the days. See, kids will never know. But all the, the proliferation now with with self-publishing, allowing more writers to get more ideas out there. I just think it's like a it's like a what do you call it? Avalanche that you can't stop. So thank you. <laughs> because like you said. If mainstream archaeology has one point of view, fine, that's your point of view. But, (coughs) excuse me, if there's a lot of evidence being unearthed that goes against that point of view, what are you serving? I mean, what purpose are you serving by not letting the truth of history come forth? It's going to come forth at some point, you know? It's just so bizarre. Well, you can't keep some, you know, some secrets can be kept, I guess, but I don't think secrets can be kept forever. So, But I think people are starting to look, you know, and I'm talking about some of the ancient texts that we have, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Ramayana, right. the Mahabharata, you know, some of these ancient texts that, you know, up until recently, you know, and I'm going to even, uh, you know, and I'm even going to push this date back, you know, up until the 1930s. You know, people thought that they were just flights of fancy because the things that are talked about in in them were impossible. They were just, you know, you didn't have flying machines and you didn't have these kinds of weapons that can annihilate mountains and do all of this stuff. Right. Where today we have Star Trek. Yeah. We know you can do this kind of stuff. and, right. and uh, Our science fiction of, of the late 1800s is now like science fact. So were they speculating a little bit ahead of time? Possibly, but that's they still had to have some foundation upon which to speculate. You know, and, and very well they could have had everything they wrote about. And it's our misinterpretation of our own past that makes us refuse to believe that. And, you know, you're right. I mean, it's hard to verbalize, but I think there's a growing frustration, and this is why there's such, in my opinion, there seems to be like a renewed fascination with archaeology. I mean, have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Really? Just, I mean, I'm talking people that were never interested in it before, too. And I think it's like a collective frustration with knowing that, the history that we have been taught is just, there's lots of myths and puzzle pieces. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. come on. <laughs> we want to know who we are, where we came from, how we got from there to here. And that sort of rising demand is what is allowing for the exchange of information that the mainstream can't control. 
But, you know, the idea that we wrote down these epically long narratives Uh and they were just flights of fancy, you know, as I like to say, are you trying to say that our ancestors wrote down a Danielle Steele novel or a Stephen (laughs) King one, you know, so that it could be saved in stone so we could have it thousands of years later? I don't think so. And especially as hard as it was to get something down during that time. I mean, you didn't just type. they didn't have whiteout (laughs) or spell check. (laughs) Right. But we do have writing for entertainment. We do have oral tradition for entertainment. But guess what? Even that has incredible truths in it. The fiction of today, a Stephen King novel, there is an awful lot that you can learn about the human experience by reading those novels. Because fiction is often just a fantastical story told upon a a firmly nonfiction backdrop that the settings are often real places. Sometimes they're characters of real people. Um, Sometimes people write fiction about historical events that actually happen. So even if those people were just writing all that stuff for pure entertainment, which I don't believe to be true at all, we still need to take a look. We need to analyze them to find out what truths about the human experience that they were going through at the time. Can we dig out of that? But I I agree with you. I don't think that's the case at all. I think they were trying to convey their understanding of what was going on around them in the best way they knew how. And sometimes they did it in a very factual sense. And sometimes they did it through storytelling. And guess what? We're still doing that today. You know, Breaking Bad was a TV show. But there was so much in that TV series that people could identify with, relate to, new people that were like that. Um, So I think that there's like different kinds of truths that are getting passed down. And it's up to us, of course, to try to figure out which is which. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think in anything that is said or done, there's some nugget somewhere. Right. And like you refer to Gilgamesh and, and this whole uh, the flood archetype or the flood motif that shows up in all kinds of myths and stories. You know, it's possible that when a lot of these texts were written, if you don't have the scientific vocabulary and you don't have the level of knowledge that we have today, to describe a traumatic event or an event that that influences and affects a lot of people, including yourself, you're going to find other ways to describe what's going on. And oftentimes, again, that comes out as stories. I mean, I think of, you know, our grandparents when they we were little and they would tell us stories about their growing up. They sounded like fantastical stories, and yet they were conveying things that actually happened to them. Maybe they were embellishing a little bit. You know, Possibly. Um, but I think on a maybe on a deeper level, that's what's going on when we look back at a religious text and say, hmm, you know, did Noah really build that ship? Well, guess what? The flood motif shows up everywhere. So chances are that story was written from the viewpoint of somebody who experienced a, the, the global flood and may have tried to save some animals. Who knows? But to totally discount it as pure entertainment kind of implies that people back then who were very survival-based had an awful lot of extra time on their hands. I don't know if I buy that. (laughs) Or, you know, I just think that they don't give our ancestors credit. And, you know, they they realized that they were smart enough to build the pyramids, a feat uh-huh. we can't do, exactly. but they were they were dumb, so dumb they couldn't yeah. recognize what was right in front of their face, even though they exactly. might not have had the vocabulary to express it. I think vocabulary and the you know the level of scientific understanding has a lot to do with it. We can't apply our level of communication and understanding to people that lived without all of the trappings of technology that we're so used to. And I think we're kind of a little arrogant if we try to do that. It's like, what, our experience is the only right one? I mean, that simply doesn't, especially if you go back to primitive times, 
you know, even before the ancient culture, cultures and civilizations that were getting more sophisticated in their art and their writing systems and everything. But if you go back to primitive times, cave and rock art, they were trying to tell us something. It may have been something as trivial as, guess what, there's only six buffalo left. <laughs> or, you know, Mary Jean's pregnant down the road. They were still trying to convey information. And to say that they were just doodles on a cave wall, you're right. I mean, it's a little bit insulting. Well, you know, and the even more insulting part is what if, you know, they were right and our religious belief and how we interact with the planet and interact with each other is not right. And we're really the ones that are going to burn in hell. <laughs> it could be. It could be. It could happen. It's, you know, it all comes down to interpretation, unfortunately. And if we don't interpret things the way they meant them, we're, you know, then you're just going down the wrong road. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you have people arguing, of course, over how to interpret something. And you could take the most crude drawing on the side of a cave wall of some type of, you know, buffalo bison or some type of, of animal that was probably hunted and used for food and clothing it was very important to that particular tribe and have 25 people interpret that image in different ways rather than maybe all of them saying, gee, <laughs> let's take this literally that this animal was very important to these people, probably because their survival was, you know, directly tied, linked to it. Um, so, and especially I think with the religious texts where you have belief come into play is that it, they've changed so much over the years that we're now interpreting interpretations. We're not even interpreting original source material. And so we're stepping even further away from our own origins and the, the questions that we really want answered because now we're trying to dissect and analyze somebody else's dissection. Well, and we're really in a lot of areas in a very sad state of affairs. You know, there is the Library of Alexandra. I hate to come back to that again, you know, is gone. So we lost all that material. We lost all of the Mayan, you know, Aztec right. material. That's all gone. And we went around the world and basically annihilated indigenous cultures and we have little pockets of wisdom right. that you know is just the surface of yeah. what's going yeah. on. And and I know a lot of those cultures, they relied as well on oral tradition, but if that chain isn't, you know, isn't continuous... If, if your country is being conquered by the Spaniards, they'll take your oral tradition and they'll rewrite it and spread it themselves. So everything just comes to a complete halt, halt in terms of the truth. And like you said, little pockets get to us from here and there, but possibly not enough to really understand our history. So I think, you know, it becomes even more important, I think, when the two sides work together, the sides that are working on the symbols and the archetypes and the imagery and trying to properly interpret what all this stuff is. And then the people that are digging up the actual physical evidence that might correspond with it, that becomes really important. But I mean, which do you think came first, the physical evidence or the stories? I think you know, the physical evidence in terms of how they lived, when they were able to start, when alphabetical systems and writing systems developed, or when they began carving things into actual objects, all of that stuff is like almost like a separate trajectory of history. And then we have to sort of match that up with the the oral traditions that have been carried down, and you know, the ones that made it. I think it's almost like you're taking... 12 different lines of communication that you have to kind of all put together and make it make sense. I'm not sure which would have come first. I mean, I think back probably our, our experience of life just for the sheer matter of survival may have left behind earlier physical clues than when we started to feel the necessity maybe to communicate our ideas and our beliefs. That might have come a little bit later, but I, I can't prove that. I'm just saying that I think 
in a sort of common sense way that, you know, we, we would have been focused in primitive times, obviously, on just surviving and keeping the species surviving and getting from area to area to find food and water and shelter. And I think, sure, out of those experiences probably was born the desire to communicate, to spread ideas, to tell stories, to uh, pass information down to the next generation so they didn't make the same mistakes. But that's just my opinion. Well, you know, they didn't have the internet or cable TV, so they had to do something around the fire at night. Well, that's they told some killer ghost stories. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the cryptids they probably talked about. I mean, you're right. Well, why do we assume that humans were so different from from us? They did the same things. They just did them with different technology, or they did it without technology. But I think that we've always, as as human beings... We don't just have the drive to survive. We want to get something out of it. And some of that is communicating with other people, sharing experiences, laughing, uh, you know, telling stories. Uh, what happened to you back there, you know, with that woolly mammoth or whatever? <laughs> oh, what happened to you? I mean, that's just a natural part of who we are as human beings. I'm not sure that's something that developed just lately. I think that's probably always been a part of who we are. And so we have to apply that same understanding back to a time when they didn't have the same means of communication that we did. And wow, people can get very narrow-minded about that because everybody today is just so focused on what we do. We have Facebook. We have Twitter. I can text you. I can call you on the telephone. I can, we can watch a movie. You know, we can read a book. And so back then, if you think about all they had was their mouths and then the very crude ability that they had to begin drawing and carving information and then eventually writing it. But, you know, if you think about it, even the when you come into the period where people could write, the the amount of the population that had that skill set, you know, that worked as described or, you know, knew how to write... Um, was still so small, but it didn't inhibit the ability of storytelling happening in the pub over a pint. Exactly, exactly. In fact, probably the job then of the first scribes was to document things that were important to the community. And they may have been very trivial things, the population, how many kids there were, who's pregnant, you know, how many sheep this guy has. It could have been just very trivial record keeping and I know that that is true but I think eventually the more people that learn that form of communication it obviously opens up different reasons for communicating you know you're not just doing it anymore um, for so, for practical reasons you could be doing it now for enjoyment or you could be doing it to communicate very specific information with just your family or leaving behind information for your children or what have you so yeah, absolutely. As more and more people learned how to write, there were more and more reasons why they would. And, you know, but you still had the people that went to the pub and told stories over beer because that's a, a wonderful form of communication. And guess what? Even with the Internet and Facebook and everything today, we still have we still go to bars or we go out to eat with our friends because that FaceTime is such a rich form of communication. And often the stories that we tell across that dinner table are the ones that we remember the most because it's such a personal, intimate experience. But don't post it on Facebook because it'll become a viral myth. Yes. Well, <laughs> you know. Oh, it, it has to go on YouTube. Totally go viral. <laughs> if you want something to be in China within 10 seconds, <laughs> put it on the Internet. I mean, how amazing is that, that we can do that now? We can send anything viral within a matter of seconds. The problem is we can send anything viral in the matter of seconds, and that includes a lot of junk information or bad ideas or misinformation. So it's sort of a blessing and a curse. Well, you know what I find very interesting, just in that whole idea of things going viral you know, you, you hear about these videos that have gone viral and you go look at the video and they're they're stupid. And it's like, well, did it go viral because it's getting all of this <laughs> because, it's because it's stupid? 
<laughs> it appeals. And, you know, that's another thing that we looked at that applies to, to yesteryear as well as to today is that there are very specific reasons why certain things go viral. One of the most important is humor. People love to share what made them laugh. And so it could be stupid, like a kitten romping around. But if it makes you smile or laugh or feel better, you're more likely to pass it on to someone. Things that evoke any kind of powerful emotion, whether it's anger, fear, hatred, uh, bigotry, (laughs) Hmm. Um, you know, any kind of emotional uh, reaction that we have, we're more likely to spread that on to friends and family. If it's practical information, like, hey, here's a better way to do this, guys, that will get spread quicker. Um, if it comes from a source that you trust, you're going to, you're going to spread that information more quickly than if it came from a stranger. So yeah, there are these different key elements that are behind things that go viral. And sometimes the more stupid something is, the more people like to see it because they can laugh and go, oh, that's so stupid. I've got to show Joe and Mary and, you know, they'll get a kick out of this. (laughs) So that's probably why stupid YouTube videos get so many hits. Well, I'm I'm looking under my desk. What does that say about uh, human nature, huh? <laughs> well, it just makes me go, oh, so that's why my dog got 280,000 Facebook fans for having a tinfoil hat, and I, like, am struggling to have 5,000, you know? And it's just like, because I do practical stuff, and she's cute and has a tinfoil hat. Lady, you put a tinfoil hat in a dog, you're going to get a lot of hits. <laughs> Can this poodle wearing a tinfoil hat get more fans than Glenn Beck? 280,000 Facebook fans. But, you know, you see something like that and you chuckle. Ah, oh, that's funny. And you pass it on to 2,000 of your friends just with one <laughs> clip. And see, it's so easy now for us to pass it on to so many people because all we have to do is post it here and there and they'll post it. It's like that old commercial, you know, I pass it on to two friends and so on and so on. And then it's in another country in 10 seconds. And if they could just send a dollar each, it would all be good. (laughs) I know. I know. (laughs) People have done that, you know. (laughs) Anyway, Marie, I'm looking at the clock and we need to wrap up. So what do we have like two minutes? What do you have coming up? Because you you guys are like writing fools. So what's coming up? We're working on some fiction. And after writing Viral Mythology, we really got this urge to try writing fiction that has fact embedded in it. So that's what we're working on now. Mm -hmm. More to come. More details to come soon. (laughs) And so if people want to get your new, new, I I keep going, new book, you know, because I knew about this book for like months and months and months and months new book viral mythology um where can they Any, send her yeah i mean all places books are sold brick and mortar online so do you like well, have so, books at your house so if they wanted an autograph copy they could get one from i you? my author my family is so big that any author copies i get go to my family but people can arrange to send it to me and i'll sign it and mail it back okay I've you done know, that. That's just like stuff, you know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I've had. I've done that for people. So, you know, I always love having you come on the show. I know. <laughs> we end up talking about just the coolest stuff, and uh-huh. <laughs> it has anything to do with anything. But we have a good time. <laughs> well, no, you know, I people totally respond good when it's just this conversation, yeah. you know, spontaneous conversation, because this is how myths start. Well, it is, and we really touched on the stuff that obviously gets us going. And that's why you write books to begin with, because something gets you going. (laughs) Yeah, so it's all good. It is all good. Well, the music's going to be coming up in a second. Music is rolling. They just sent me the message. Music is rolling. (laughs) Marie, (laughs) thank you so much for coming on the show, and I'm sure I will talk to you soon on Facebook. And uh all righty thank you so much i'll talk to you soon good okay, night bye that's marie jones her webpage is marie d jones.com her new book is viral mythology she just came out with the grid a few months ago with larry flaxman and we'll be back with susan shumsky after these words from our sponsor just energy radio with your host dr re louise will return right after these messages 